I am Mary Elliott. I work at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I am the curator of American slavery at the museum. I had the pleasure of co-curating the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition with my colleague Nancy Burkhoff. And of course, that exhibition covers a large sweep of history, including from mid 15th century all the way through Reconstruction. Wow, how did I become interested in the history of slavery? You know, I have a very different path from other people, um, and maybe not in some ways, because I started doing this because of an interest in my family history. I actually, you know, majored in business in, in undergraduate, but in undergraduate school at Howard, but I have a family that has a strong history of family reunions, recounting our family history. And, and I remember my relatives told me, we've designated you as the next person to carry on the family history. And I was like, I don't have time, I'm busy. But I kept all the records my, my relatives sent me and I just started looking into it. And one of the things I came across was our family was good friends with Booker T. Washington. And so I went into the manuscript collection at the Library of Congress and spent months there. And it just went from there. Um, tons of history that I found out that turned from a personal project to a larger African-American history research project. And um, as a result of that, I got many contracts doing consulting work for organizations. And um, I traveled to Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Virginia, tracking down this um, answers to my history research questions. And um, in the meantime, I had, you know, earned my law degree and, and which prepared me for this because it allowed me to do research analysis and writing. And then I was approached to apply for this job. And um, at first I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and then someone convinced me to apply and I got the position and I've never looked back. And, you know, there's some things you just kind of have to go with when God whispers in your ear to, you know, take that step. And it was a blessing. It was a blessing. So African-American men um, and people of African descent before we become this nation during the revolutionary period, um, but they fought for their freedom during the revolutionary period. You see some regiments that are formed that are interracial regiments. That's very important to note. Regiments that included black, white, and American Indian. Mm -hmm. um, very powerful to think about that, who are fighting for um, fighting for the patriots. But then you also have um, during the Civil War period, these U.S. colored troops, mm -hmm. these all black regiments, um, often led by white officers and working alongside white officers. And it was not an easy path. Again, as I mentioned, there were certain perspectives of people of African descent, of African Americans. Um, and it plays out, it's really interesting to think about it, how it played out in the military during the Civil War. We talk about um, emancipation and the Civil War bringing an end to slavery. But the idea of, again, there are people who can think, well, we don't feel that there should be slavery, but we still see you as less than, as beneath um, white Americans. And so there, these men face racism and they fe faced unequal treatment. Again, using that example of pay in itself, you know, and then also considering who had the opportunity to become a high ranking officer. So all of that's really quite interesting to think about. Here you are fighting alongside others, fighting to change the nation, but how, to what extent has the nation changed? Drastically in terms of ending slavery, but still there's the issue of race, of racism. In the case of the Civil War, you have, for example, um, a major important role of Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. who is, you know, the premier um, voice of freedom for African Americans and beyond freedom, including equality and justice. And so here's this man who escaped slavery, who, um, you know, told his story both in the written word and through, um, you know, as a great orator promoting freedom for African Americans. And he pushed that um, through military service as well as he met with and spoke with 
Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln, pushing for African American men to be able to fight on the front lines. And so we see during the Civil War where 1862, you have the Emancipation Proclamation 1863, it only frees people who were enslaved um, in jurisdictions that had seceded from the Union, right? So if you're in a border state like Maryland, where they hadn't seceded from the Union, they still maintained slavery, they still um, had free people of color in that state. But with that Emancipation Proclamation, there's also this notion that if you can get to Union Army lines, you can secure your freedom. And so African Americans on these plantation sites flee towards the Union Army lines. Confederates say return our property and the um, Union Army very strategically says, well, property, therefore contraband of war. So you see what is termed as contraband camps popping up all over throughout the sites where the war is taking place. And these are the folks who were pushing to be able to fight on the front lines to fight for their freedom. So what is this war to keep the Union together turns into this war for freedom as they finally have the opportunity to be out on those front lines. And not just on the front lines, they were digging trenches, they were doing a lot of different work to fight for their freedom. There's an interesting story I should add to that where there were some people who were in the, um, in the contraband camps. I believe there's a case in Ohio. It's a young man I know who, um, is currently pursuing his PhD, but he presented a really interesting case of um, folks who were impressed, even in the Union Army. So we know that there were people who were impressed to serve on behalf of the Confederates as um, body servants, to be out in the fields, um, on the battlefields with their slaveholders or enslavers. But the notion of people being impressed into the Union Army is quite interesting, um, serving to dig trenches and um, do other things where they, on one hand, didn't want to do. So I'm really excited to see what his dissertation brings forward. He um, recounted a specific story that took place in Ohio. So, you know, um, one thing I love about our museum is having the opportunity to speak with established scholars, but also to watch as new scholarship is coming forward and as, as particularly young scholars, particularly for me, young scholars, um, African-American scholars who are excited about this history and sharing even more about the stories that we would otherwise not know about. Working in these contraband camps, there were women who served as nurses, they served as laundresses. And so while we talk about, you know, military service, your mind instantly goes to being on the front lines. But there were people who were on the front lines, there were people who were digging trenches, and then you have women who are supporting the people who are on the front lines fighting for freedom. So it's important to acknowledge those who served as nurse, nurses and laundresses. And this is during the Civil War, I'm speaking of also particularly because there are women like um, Harriet Tubman, who at one point served as a nurse and then was the first woman to serve as a, a military spy on behalf of the Union Army, where she ultimately went down to South Carolina and helped free 700 um, enslaved people down in the South Carolina area. But then you also have people like Susie King Taylor and um, we talk about like what it was like for these men to serve in the military. While there were men who served in the Union, Ar Union Army, the truth is there were plenty of people who said um, slavery shouldn't exist, but I still don't see you as my equal. And so there was the issue of African-American men who served in the U.S. colored troops who um, were not getting paid equal pay as their white counterparts. And so some of them refused to take their payment until they could get equal pay. But Susie King Taylor was one of those advocates who pushed for these men to get their equal pay. She served as a Union Army nurse. And ultimately, when the war ended, she opened her own hospital in Savannah. Just, just so amazing. And, and despite the um, coronavirus and our current quarantine situation, um, what I love is that our visitors can still remain visitors and see the We Remain Fighting exhibition online, which is absolutely amazing. And so here you have these men who go to war, World War I, and they return home and there's this idea of um, double V, the fight for um, freedom and democracy abroad and then having to fight for that at home. And so these men return and there's this period of, you know, they return to being lynched. 
and the danger of just walking through the streets in their uniforms. And um, again, a racist and segregated United States. And so you see where there are race riots that occur throughout the nation. And these men who have fought um, abroad and come home, and again, that same military skill, they are present and ready to fight back. We often talk about People talk about victimization and African-Americans being victims, but these men and women, <laughs> if I can say anything, we have to acknowledge there were some people who were like, you may try and kill me, but you are gonna have to die trying. And so they use their skills to fight back. And they fight back in these communities where there are these so-called race riots taking place. I say so-called because when we think about, for example, the Tulsa race massacre, now people refer to this as the massacre, not the riot. Um, oftentimes you hear the word riot and it, it's almost like a reflection on the black people, black people were rioting. But in fact, these are incidents that occur oftentimes surrounding someone being accused of raping a young white woman. They take a man and, and they, they lynch them or they intend to lynch them. In the case of the Tulsa race massacre, a young man was in jail and the white citizens were prepared to pull him out of jail and um, ultimately lynch him. That was the understanding of the black community. And so they went to the, um, to the jailhouse to protect him. And so there's all of this that happens, but at the heart of this, you see these black men who are prepared to protect their communities and use that military skill. So they flip the script. You may come for me, you may try and lynch me, you may disrespect all that I did, all my service, all that I've done to protect this nation and lift up democracy, but I will be damned if you go and destroy my community. And so I, I really appreciate it because um, it shows the strength of the will of these men and women who were determined by any means necessary um, to be able to live free, equal, and with justice. There were, the military service afforded these men the opportunity to um, use their military skills to protect their communities. So again, um, and also to gain leadership positions in their communities. So if you think of people who served in the military during the Revolutionary War, who gain their freedom, and these men, um, you know, have opportunities to serve as respected leaders in their communities, in their free communities. But then you have um, also the fact that many of these, after many of these wars, these men use their skill to protect their communities. So when you have Reconstruction period, you have, you'll see the Union Leagues pop up, and the Union Leagues are in, comprised of many men who served in the military during the Civil War, who um, use their military skill to enforce their right to vote. When you have this period of the Reconstruction Amendments coming through, 13th Amendment ending slavery, 14th Amendment providing citizenship and due process, 15th Amendment allowing African American men to vote. There are jurisdictions where men take to the streets um, drumming, in um, military formation, carrying guns, marching into the streets, calling other African-American men and women out to the streets to enforce their right to vote, particularly around that 1876 period when you see this transition um, with the government where there's this 1876, um, the compromise of the election at that time, Rutherford B. Hayes takes over and the federal troops are pulled out of the South. And so you see these people using their military skill to march in formation and make a statement to come out drumming like military, um, like, like we see with the military formations and calling people out to the streets to enforce their right to vote. You see the same thing happen um, during the modern civil rights era where you have this formation of these men, the deacons for defense, who use their skill from the Korean War, from World War II, that use their skill to protect their communities. And some of them actually were, um, were um, used to help protect civil rights leaders as they traveled throughout the nation. So the Deacons for Defense are another group that includes many men who gain their experience through military service. So very, very powerful to think about, um, not only are you fighting for freedom, but you're using this skill skillset um, you know, to be able to say, 
I'm making a statement, I'm taking a stand. And the idea that these are men who came back from wars, who fought to change a nation and who fought for freedom and human rights abroad, but were treated less than when they were at home. Well, some of the things that come to mind for me is the role of seamen and the impact of them traveling globally through that maritime network. Um, how did news pass from one jurisdiction to another, um, you know, even beyond the nation, um, about military service, about rebellions. Um, and so I think that's really important to think about that maritime network and how news got out about actions going on throughout the world. So there are, um, there's communication between people in Philadelphia and Haiti during the time of the Haitian Revolution. I think that's very important to keep in mind. And I think our visitors should, you know, I'm dropping little gems here and there, and we only have so much time, but I encourage people to um, do some research and find out a little bit more some because there's some great scholars out there who have written about um, much of this activity. There's one in particular that comes to mind, um, Laurent Dubois, who's based down at Duke University. He writes um, extensively about the Haitian Revolution. Then there's a gentleman named um, Dr. Jeffrey Kerr Ritchie, who is a scholar at Howard University. He writes extensively about rebellions and freedom movements. And then also with the Revolutionary War, um, you have a gentleman, um, Dr. Gerald Horn, a very um, esteemed scholar who writes about the Revolutionary War and, and people of African descent, their involvement in the revolution. Revolutionary War, and I believe he likens it to a, an, a Black rebellion. So just really powerful to think about the scholars who inform us and help us shape what we put in our exhibition to get people to think more deeply beyond just Black men served in the military. Well, what did that mean? And why is that important? And how did that add to the development of the nation? How did that add to Black intellectual thought? How did that add to how we think about freedom? And so to think about, you know, this history during the month that we have Memorial Day and Memorial Day um, is recognized most recently based on scholarship by the renowned scholar David Plight, written in his book Race and Reunion, who uncovered some dynamic history of African-Americans who um, reinterred the bodies of men who gave their lives during the Civil War, who were buried behind a grandstand of a racehorse track when they had been held as Union Army, by the Confederates as Union Army prisoners of war. And so um, these African-American men and women dug up these, these men's bodies, they reinterred them, gave them a proper burial. They um, had a procession of 10,000 people including 3,000 school children. Majority of the audience at that procession were African-American, but it included white educators, white missionaries, right after the Civil War, 1865. And what they did was they went through the streets all carrying roses. It was, um, it was um, um, different um, mutual aid societies. It was different men who had served in the military. And they created this burial ground they call um, um, Martyrs of the Racetrack is what it's called. And so that is really seen as the day that marks the beginning of Memorial Day, Decoration Day, where they march through and they place flowers on these grave sites. And I think that's something to remember at this time as we're reflecting on military service, as we're reflecting on people who gave their lives, as this is the month of Memorial Day, that we understand more deeply that this is not just a day to have hot dogs and hamburgers. And unfortunately, we can't see each other up close and hug each other like we would like to. But this does give us an opportunity to really reflect on the importance of the military service and the service of men and women for our freedom and for equality and justice and human rights. So that's what I would like to share with our visitors, um, our digital visitors, and one day soon, our visitors in person. So thank you for giving me this opportunity.